I know you've read the uh, counterinsurgency article, or at least it was a sign. And what I'd like to uh, do is uh, make three points. And I'll make these brief, assuming that uh, you have read it, or perhaps if you haven't, it will stimulate enough interest to, uh, to read it. But the, the counterinsurgency strategy was applied in a very robust way in Afghanistan in 2009. And the point of going over a critique of this strategy, actually a doctrine, is if you're in the world of international security and policy making, asking the right questions when presented with the strategy. Point number one, um, for those that have uh, done a review of counterinsurgency strategy, raise your hand if you understand the term protect the population. OK, some out there. They, they, the, the first uh, principle of counterinsurgency doctrine is protect the population. And the idea being then with the population being protected from the insurgent force, that over time that population then will show increasing support to the legitimate government of the country and the insurgents will be cut off from the population and they'll eventually wither on the vine. So that's protect the population. That became a big mantra. Whether you were at platoon level, 40 soldiers, or you're at strategic level, 100,000 soldiers, the mantra is protect the population. But that begs the question, what does protect the population actually mean? So uh, if we say we're protecting the population, would you say that that should include protect the population against Taliban attacks? OK, I would agree with that. Uh, which should it include protecting the population against narco traffickers? Okay, we're, we're shifting from the mission of it's about Taliban, but okay, narco traffickers are, uh, they're disruptive and uh, they take away from efforts to build legitimate government. What about, a, uh, what about a venal police chief in a particular district of Afghanistan who is predatory and is actually hurting government efforts to build a legitimate government. Should we deal with that corrupt poli uh, police chief? Okay. Now, what about um, what about a tribe, a small tribe that's being preyed upon by a major tribe, and this conflict has gone on for hundreds of years? But the small tribe has now got Taliban on their side because Taliban, very smart politically. And in fact, the larger tribe is very predatory, but uh, they're related to President Karzai. What do we do in that case? That's a, uh, it's a tougher issue now. It, our, is our job to resolve tribal fighting and do we have to broker the tribal fighting? Uh, what about the instance where you say, well, Taliban has an inability to provide health care and uh, education. And so one of our goals has got to be then to provide health care for everyone and make sure everyone gets uh, education. Is that a vital security goal then that we should be trying to achieve? OK. Um, we also say that Taliban is able to feed off of unemployment in the country. And so should we be saying that another goal should be full employment for Afghanistan? Ideally. Ideally. OK, what I wanted to do there, we started with Al Qaeda and Taliban. And you see where this line of questioning can go. And each one of those answers, I think, is correct. If you have time, if you have resources, if you have political commitment. But if you're in Washington, D.C., and you're looking at huge fiscal deficits, and you're looking at eroding support for the operation, and you know that time is not necessarily on your side, then you have to start to make trade-offs here. So I would say first, this bumper sticker, protect the population, you need to dig into that further, and you need to start to ask harder questions about what does this really mean, what does this entail, What's the political end state we're trying to achieve here? Number two is there's an assumption 
that just more effort in Afghanistan will eventually lead to the growth of legitimate government. But think about the contract that's implicit in democratic republics. And the implicit contract is one in which a president is elected, and the head of state and government takes charge, and he's received the vote from the people, and now he's going to impose obligations and taxes on those people, and in return, his or her administration will then provide benefits. And we have another election cycle, the people vote, how did that contract work out in the last round, and we go on from there. But look in the case of Afghanistan. 90% of the revenue of the state of Afghanistan is provided by foreign assistance. They get some of their budget from customs at the border, but in the main, the government of Afghanistan is not taxing the people. And what about the delivery of those services in return? The delivery of the services is to an extraordinary extent provided by foreign military forces and is provided by development assistance. So that contract that's implicit doesn't really exist. Back in 1969, a Stanford professor still here wrote in a book, The United States in Vietnam, talking about the Vietnam War. The USA thus provided South Vietnamese President Diem with the degree of financial independence that isolated him from basic economic and political realities and reduced his need to appreciate or respond to his people's wants and to their expectations. And this same phenomena exists in Afghanistan. Third and final point, and then we'll open it up for Q&As, is that counterinsurgency doctrine does assume that the strategic goals and objectives of host nations, Afghanistan in this case, and foreign counterinsurgency forces, the United States and NATO in this case, are aligned. But I would tell you that this decidedly has not been the case in Afghanistan.